so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. Hey, it's Gemma here, the host of True Crime Conversations. In the last week, you might have seen the news that Sue Neil Fraser, who was found guilty of murdering her partner Bob Chappell aboard their yacht in Tasmania in 2009, has been granted parole. Sue's expected to leave prison within weeks after serving more than 13 years behind bars. Up until now, as you'll hear in this episode, she's always maintained her innocence and her supporters insisted she wouldn't apply for parole because to do so, she'd have to admit guilt. In light of this new information and Sue's upcoming release, we wanted to revisit our chat with true crime author Robin Bowles. I hope you enjoy this episode. Next week, I'm going to be delving into the murder of Jill Ma in light of the 10-year anniversary of her death. It's 7am on January 27, 2009 in Hobart, Tasmania, and Sunil Fraser is woken up by a phone call. It's the police. Four Winds, the boat she shares with her partner Bob Chappell, is sinking on its mooring in the River Derwent. Sue falls silent. 65-year-old Bob is on board. She left him there at around 2pm the day before, taking their inflatable white dinghy back to shore with her. He'd decided to crash on board for the night so he could continue tinkering away at a few things. Upon hearing this, Marine police quickly board the 16-metre catch with a pump to try and keep it afloat. It doesn't take long for them to notice the vessel has been sabotaged. A 75-millimetre pipe near the toilet has been severed, allowing the water to rush in. The seacock A valve that allows water to flow in and out of the boat is also open. Bob is nowhere to be found. But blood splatters are discovered on a lounge suite, a stepladder and a torch. A knife is discovered lying on the floor. On shore, Sue is bent over in shock. When her daughter arrives, she notices she won't stop pacing and talking. She kept just saying, Bob, Bob, like she was, it was the weird, I, it was awful. It was really awful to the point I remember I picked up the phone to the GP when I got a script for mum for Valium. There's no body, no injuries to be interpreted, no murder weapon. But Sue is about to become the number one suspect in a murder investigation. In the eyes of many, this case will become one of the worst miscarriages of justice in Australian history. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Robin Bowles, who's been writing about crime for over 25 years. Her book, Death on the Derwent, investigates the circumstances that led Sue Neil Fraser to be convicted of Bob Chappell's murder. To start with, Robin, how is it that you came across this case? Bob and his former wife actually lived next door to my mother in West Hobart. And Bob worked at the hospital at the Royal Hobart. And so did I. I was a nurse back then. So I knew him, but I didn't know him very well. And way after he died, I was driving with my son. He said to me, Mum, you've got to write a book about Bob Chappell. I said, what, Bob Chappell that used to live next door to my mother? And he said, yeah. He said his wife pushed him off a boat and killed him. And he said they've got her because they got her on the CCTV camera down on Sandy Bay Road, you know, coming home in the middle of the night. And, you know, they've got a bang to rights sort of thing. And I said, wow, that doesn't sound good. (laughs) So I was interested, of course, because I had that personal connection, but I was also interested on, you know, how someone would do that and get on a boat and toss somebody overboard in the middle of the Derwent, you know, and and just drive home as if nothing had happened. So um, I contacted various family members and by this time Sue was about to be tried. 
And when you started looking into it, what did you learn about Bob Chappell and Sunil Fraser's relationship? Like how long had they been in a relationship and what was the life that they'd created together? Well, they'd been in a relationship about 16 years. Bob was actually married to somebody else before and he has children from that relationship. And so was Sue and she has daughters. And Bob was like exactly the sort of character like Albie Mangles. I don't know if you remember Albie Mangles. You might be too young. No, I don't. You'll have to enlighten me. He was just the same. He's hunched forward. He had fuzzy hair, smoked a pipe. He was a funny old guy, really, much older than he, you know, actually was, in fact, and he worked in the oncology department at the Royal. He and Sue got on pretty well. She was very outgoing and gregarious and he'd just tag along, but always part of the couple, you know, and they got on very well. And they had this new yacht, the Four Winds. Was that their joint hobby? The way that came about was that, Bob and Sue decided that they were going to buy a floating shack for their retirement and they wanted a big boat so they could stay at sea and also have kids along, you know, for weekend trips and what have you. Neither of them were really experienced sailors. They'd both sailed, but a lot of people sail in Tasmania. But this required really a professional handling. So they were pretty stupid about that, to be honest. But anyway, they bought this boat of their dreams up in Queensland called the Four Winds. They had to hire a couple of guys to sail it down to Hobart because they didn't know the ropes, literally, on the boat. So Bob was on the bed in the main cabin and he had a very bad nosebleed. He had them from time to time and they put him in New South Wales, Bega, I think, and he sought medical advice and they put him in hospital. So Sue decided to continue on without him and down to Hobart. Now, that trip was quite pivotal in Sue's trial because the two guys that sailed the boat down observed that there was tension between the two of them, they said, and also that Sue was seemed to be quite happy to get rid of Bob off the boat and take over. They didn't like her much. They thought she was quite bossy and she is a bit like that. You know, some people are, but I think their relationship was very sound because as I said earlier, she was the outgoing one, she was the boss, and he was kind of, you know, the more pliant, quieter partner. But looking from the outside, I suppose, you know, people see different things. But it was important later in evidence. So they sailed the boat down. There was quite a lot wrong with it. And they paid a squillion dollars for it, and it was the biggest boat in Hobart. So they had to have a special mooring made out in the centre of just on the ledge where the Derwent drops down into a big deep channel outside the yacht club. And this is in Sandy Bay, isn't it? In Sandy Bay, exactly right. And in fact, the mooring is very easy to see from the shore, even though it's quite a long way out. So there was a lot still wrong with the boat. And so Bob spent quite a lot of time fiddling about and he was enjoying it. He had a bit of a scientific, you know, bent and he was quite practical. They took it on one trip to Bruny Island, which isn't very far away, to sort of check it out on their own with couple of members of the family and that was the only trip they all did. Because of course of what happened on January 26, 2009, they'd both been working on the boat that morning but eventually Sue ended up leaving Bob while she went back to shore. Can you walk us through what actually happened that day? Bob was out on the boat on his own during the day and Sue took Bob's sister, who was visiting from a long way away, I think she comes from Ecuador or Venezuela or something, she's married someone from over there, out to lunch at the sailing club, the yacht club, they like to call it the yacht club. So after lunch, the sister went off and did her thing and, in fact, went and visited her nephews and nieces and Sue sailed out again to the boat in the little dinghy thing they had, it was an inflatable thing, out to the boat to make sure Bob was okay and pick him up. But he didn't want to come back. He was right in the middle of this. He had stuff all over the floor. He was up to his eyeballs in bits and pieces and he decided he'd like to stay. So Sue left him her mobile phone on the boat and left him there and went home. The next thing that happened, according to Sue, is that around about 10.30 that night, she got a phone call from someone she'd never heard of And he claimed to be a therapist who was looking after Bob's youngest daughter. 
Now, his youngest daughter, Claire, it's not a secret, she has a few emotional issues. So he said that she was very worried about Bob and he wanted to talk to Bob. And Sue said, well, he's not here. He's on the boat. What's going on? And he said, well, she's very worried because she thinks something bad's going to happen to him on the boat. And so Sue got a bit anxious about this. She gave this guy Bob's son's number, said you better ring him and have a talk to him. So she sat there worrying about him for quite a while. So then she decided that she'd drive down and make sure that the boat was okay. So she drove to the foreshore and saw everything was quiet on the boat, lights off and sitting there quietly. So she went home and it was that trip that was caught on the CCTV along Sandy Bay Road in the middle of the night, it was after one o'clock I think. And then she got home and she went to bed. And the morning the police rang or the harbour master rang and said, you and Bob had better come down because the boat's sinking. So she said, Bob's on the boat, but I'll be there in a minute. So she flew down to the foreshore, notified the family. They all congregated down there. And sure enough, the boat was sinking. And then when the police knew that there was supposed to be someone on it, they raced out there and he wasn't there. So then it was created as a crime scene. They pumped it up enough to drag it into the Constitution dock and people crawled all over it for days. And one other thing happened that morning. Somebody found a red sort of all-weather coat over a fence along the foreshore and they took that and showed it to Sue and she said it wasn't hers. But, in fact, they had quite a few coats on the boat for people when they went out. And it later transpired that her DNA was found on that jacket. So the police thought that was another big strike against her. So this scene of the boat, let's go back to that. They find it, you know, half sinking. There's a lot of evidence that's been left. There's some blood. There's a carving knife. There's a bloody torch. The yacht's obviously been tampered with. This pretty quickly would have turned from a disappearance into a murder investigation, right? Absolutely. That's why it was made into a crime scene. So they got the forensic people on board and, yes, those things mainly I think were bagged and tagged. There was a dirty cloth in the bilge somewhere. They put that in a bag and the way the boat was sinking appeared to be done by someone who had a very good knowledge of boats. So it wasn't perhaps someone like me who would come aboard and think, well, there must be a hole here somewhere or make a hole. You know, the pipes were opened up and the toilet was tampered with as well. And there was some blood, but it was later argued that that blood was the blood from the nosebleed that Bob had. There was a knife, yes. So all those things were taken into custody by the police and the forensics people went aboard and they swabbed the boat end to end and they did find one quite large patch of reaction to the agent that showed that it had DNA in it and that was later tested and it was female but unknown. It wasn't attributed to any of the family members. I wanted to go back to Sue's version of events, which you touched on, because some of the things that you mentioned, she didn't actually tell the police initially. She didn't tell them that she'd had that trip in the middle of the night to go down in the car. She also told them she went to Bunnings and they later found out that they couldn't see her on any cameras and stuff like that. So they kind of started to unpick her story, didn't they? They did. Sue is a really interesting woman. I've got to know her pretty well over the last few years. And I always say to people, she talked her way into prison. (laughs) She really did. And uh, the thing is that she did go to Bunnings most days. I mean, I go to Bunnings a lot these days because I'm too old and fat to buy dresses for myself anymore and I love hardware stores. So I go and, <laughs> I go and buy hooks. Go for and, a browse. <laughs> and, you know, pop plants and yep. things. So, you know, but, I mean, because they were fixing the boat up, she was at Bunnings most days. She made a mistake saying that she went to Bunnings in the afternoon. Bunnings closed early. So she couldn't have been there that afternoon. The other thing about the trip down to the water, she didn't tell them that at first because she felt very early on that 
the police were targeting her and nobody else. And there's a thing in the law which is called consciousness of guilt. It means if you tell a lie or omit something, can be also omitting or telling, and the reason you may do it is because it puts you somewhere where even if you were there innocently, it may be construed as being you were there nefariously. So I think that because Sue was quite anxious about the attitude of the police, she didn't tell them about that trip initially, but she did in the next interview. She didn't tell them on the first interview, but she did in the second interview. I guess it would have started to look suspicious to police because there were quite a few of them. There are a few others like she told the police one time that she came back to the shore and then witnesses said it was a few hours later. And then there was the red jacket that you mentioned that she said didn't belong to her. So it was kind of like this series of things that just kept happening. Absolutely. And they're all facts, but taken as a whole, as they say in the court, they did come together as, you know, quite a good story. And I think that's why the police weren't really looking for anyone else. I wanted to ask because obviously the police had narrowed in on who they thought had murdered Bob at this point. But the other thing I wanted to mention was the media coverage at the time, because obviously when someone is murdered or a partner is murdered, society expects that person to react in a certain way. Sure. Was Sue reacting in that way that people expected? No, definitely not. And I told you she's a bit of a quirky lady. She went to boarding school in Scotland when she was young and they teach a very stiff upper lip there, no quivering bottom lip for any reason, and her parents were quite strict. So she grew up in a fairly strict household and I think she does get actually very emotional about things, but... She's been trained not to show it. Her rivers run deep, I think. And so she got tagged a bit like the Lindy Chamberlain tag. Poor old Lindy. She's a legend, isn't she? Yeah. But they tagged her as, you know, another Lindy Chamberlain. She didn't care and she not only lied but she was also uncaring about the whole situation. Yeah. When all of these lies, and some of them were just omissions, were brought to Sue, what did she say? Did she admit to them? Sometimes. Other times she blathered on. That's the best way I can explain it. Yeah. She, you know, she sort of, I don't know that she tried to cover it up, but I mean, for the Bunnings one, for example, you know, they said, well, you couldn't have been at Bunnings. We looked at all the CCTV and anyway, it was shut when you say you were there. So straight away, she basically said, oh, well, it must have been a different day. And Sue, she wouldn't stop there. Then she would say, because I went every time and I bought this and I did that, and the answer would go right out here somewhere. And she does that every time you ask her a question. You can't get a short answer from her. I've interviewed her on a lot of occasions and, you know, geez, you need a, you need a lot of lead in your pencil to get the answers written down, I can tell you. <laughs> so she didn't do herself any favours. You're absolutely right. I think another thing worth bringing up here that the police were very interested in was she had an injury on her wrist. that they thought was suspicious. Can you talk us through that? Yep. There were photos taken of her and her sister-in-law at the yacht club that day with the yachts in the background, including the four winds. And in those photos, she didn't have an injury on her wrist. But on the next day, when the police interviewed her, one sharp-eyed police officer noticed that she had this injury on her wrist. And To be honest, I can't remember the reason she gave, but it was either that she's always injuring herself on the boat or they had a dog. You know, there there were various reasons, I think, that she gave. There would have been a few knowing Sue. So Sue quickly became the cop's key suspect. Mm -hmm. What picture did the police paint of what they think happened that night on Four Winds? Right. Well, they had a scenario where she actually went out to the yacht in the afternoon and they had a big fight. That's how the hand got hurt and she sneaked up behind him with a big wrench and hit over the head with this wrench and hit and hit and hit, as the prosecutor said to the jury, not just once but he said, you know, several times. Then she left him there, went back home and then the second trip late at night she went down and took the boat out again, a little boat, wrapped him up with a fire extinguisher, lashed a fire extinguisher to him, either dragged him up two flights of stairs 
or winched him up through a small window, which was probably about, oh, 250 square, maybe 300 square, or a hatch, winched him up through there using the winch and then lowered him down into this bobbing lifeboat and then motored out into the centre of the Derwent, tipped his body in, brought the boat back, left it unattached to anything, just left it on the beach and drove home. Now that was their scenario. There were a few things wrong with that, but that was what they put together. The first thing that jumps out to me is I can imagine that a dead body, a male dead body, would be incredibly heavy. You know, like even just the physicality of what they've put forward. Exactly. Well, I've been on the boat and it's interesting because down in the saloon where they allege this murder took place, and it probably did, there's a set of stairs that goes up from the saloon. If you can imagine those big boats, you see them on TV all the time when people lift the hatch up and they go down the steps. And, well, on Sue's boat, there was one set of steps down from deck, but then you came to a landing where there was the chart house and the kitchen, the galley, and so on. And then there's another set of stairs that went down to where the bunks and the dining table area and all the saloon where that was. But they didn't line up because the kitchen was bigger than the saloon width, sort of bumped the stairs across. So to get a dead body up there, you have to drag it up one set of stairs first, then across the landing, then drag it up another set. They say the dinghy was moored at the back of the boat because that was the easiest way to get on. And so then she would have had to drag him past the wheel that steers the boat and then over the back past the big barbecue that was sitting there and then drop him into the dinghy and then sail out. Now the alternate scenario was that she winched him up from the bunk up through this hatch that was directly above. As I said, it's about 300 square if I remember it because I've seen it. So it's big enough for a body but just and then over the side that way. So you're quite right. Dead bodies are very inconvenient. They don't help you and they're heavy and if you leave them around long enough, they start smelling. So, you you know, they're not helpful. And then the other issue is that Sue had a very well-known bad back from her horse riding and it's highly unlikely that someone her age and strength and ability would have been able to do either of those things, in my view. We're going to get into some of more of the holes in the investigation a bit later on. But the one I wanted to touch on right now is that you mentioned before that there was a female DNA sample found on the boat that didn't match Sue. Correct. What did police do with that investigation when they were, you know, zeroing in on their suspect? Okay, there's a couple of things you need to know about that first. On the night that Bob was allegedly murdered, which I'm sure he was, the tide was coming in it was on the turn actually what would be on the turn later and when it turned they think that the body was swept out but at the time of his alleged murder it was coming in which meant that its pointy end was facing the exit to the sea the channel going out into the sea and its bum was facing the other way which meant that the right hand side of the boat was visible from the shore so This DNA sample was found on the left-hand side of the boat, on the deck, just next to where people got on and off. There was a little chain where you can undo the chain and hop on and off. So it was there. Uh, That's important. Then when the boat was towed into the dock, its right-hand side was beside the dock the whole time and the left-hand side was on the far side, away from the traffic. And again, when it was taken from there and tied up in a salvage yard, and again, it was tied up on with its right-hand side next to the wharf and the other side away from the traffic. So what I'm saying through all that is that I believe that the people who came on board that night tied up on the far side of the boat so they wouldn't be seen and climbed up that way. And one of the people there left her DNA and Because the forensic people swabbed the boat from end to end the first day, they picked up that DNA. But after that, because the boat had been swabbed, there was no traffic on that far side. Nobody walked through it. Nobody stepped on it. It was just sitting there. And that's quite important for later. So the police really didn't do anything about this DNA at all, actually. They just 
labelled it unknown DNA, female DNA, and put it in a drawer, I suppose. But quite a bit later, a young woman in town was arrested for shoplifting. And in Tasmania, any arrest, they take a DNA. So her DNA popped up and there it was on the database, bingo. It was from the four winds. This created a bit of a stir and Sue's lawyers were very excited about it, of course, but they weren't really told very much about it. They knew that there'd been another person on the boat, but there was a lot of material withheld from the defence during the trial. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Barth. I'm speaking with crime author Robin Bowles about Bob Chappell's disappearance and murder. And I think it's important to point out at this stage that all of the evidence was circumstantial that they were charging her on, wasn't it? Correct. Absolutely correct. And it's another thing that's quite important is that the police had managed to get a warrant to bug Sue's house. They were listening to her for all that time from end of January to August and the family, and they used to have lots of family conferences. And as I said, Sue talks a lot. So there would have been an awful lot of listening hours on that tape. And they didn't say one thing incriminating, not one thing. Daughters didn't say, tell us what really happened, Mum, or, you know, what do you think is going to happen if you get charged? What will you do? Nothing like that was said at all. And that's what police look for. So some poor bugger had to sit and listen for hours to Sue's family chatter away about inconsequential stuff, and they didn't pick up one single thing. So I think that's quite important as well. But, yes, it was all circumstantial. There was no hard evidence to link Sue to the murder at all. And then seven months later, as you mentioned, we get the arrest of this homeless teenager, Megan Vass, and her DNA pops up and it's linked to Four Winds. So what did police do with that information? Well, they didn't do much. They went to the house where she was homeless, as I said, so she stayed in shelters quite a bit. She was only a kid. She was 15. And one of the shelters she stayed in, you had to get permission to stay out overnight if you were living there. On this night, she told the shelter that she was going to visit friends up in the hill behind Mount Nelson. So she was allowed to go. But when the police officer went to find those people, the address didn't exist. Now, you'd think that would be sort of no, 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 no moment for a police officer. But no, and then they tried to get her to come in for an interview three times, I think she was three times, certainly more than twice, I think, and she just didn't turn up. And they couldn't go and drag her in because she was underage. She had to have someone with her. So by the time the trial came, they hadn't really interviewed her at all. They'd spoken to her briefly, and I think she said that she was with her boyfriend, who was a known criminal older than she was, and um, they didn't even interview him at all. And they didn't tell the defence that she was not at that address that night, that, you know, she was not accounted for. So to account for the DNA on the boat, the police said that young Megan must have left her DNA somewhere on the wharf where the boat was tied up and Mr Plod had walked in it and then trodden it onto the boat. Now, to do that, you would think that if you had DNA on your foot, on your sole of your foot, think about stepping in dog poo. That's the best way to describe it, you know. So you leave a horrible bit the first time and you're, oh, no, and if you don't notice it straight away, you've got another dirty step until you pick it up. Oh, dear, right? But in this case, they would have had to jump over the top of the whole middle of the boat to land on the other side to make that happen because there was nothing leading there. It was just in that one place. And it was quite a big patch as well. The reaction was about saucer size. The DNA, they only take a, you know, a little sample from that saucer size and then they grow, you know, I don't know how they do it, but the DNA pops up. So one could assume that the DNA was all through that saucer size sample, but there certainly did grow a section of it into DNA, yep. So Sue's trial, it gets underway in September 2010. What was her team's defence during the trial? Well, basically, she didn't do it. And, and you see, 
It's very interesting. I went to a trial in Western Australia where a doctor was the first doctor in history in Australia was accused of killing his patient by helping her to die by lethal injections. He pleaded not guilty and he didn't make a statement and he said nothing. The police tried to interview him lots of times and he said, I have nothing to say. And then he was tried and they had no evidence except the woman had the drugs in her system but they couldn't prove that he had given them to her and he was acquitted. So if Sue had said nothing and basically said, you prove it, you know, I'm not saying anything, then she probably wouldn't have been convicted. But because of the way that her defence behaved and the way that she behaved and the way the DPP behaved, I think the jury couldn't come to any other conclusion. If I'd been on the jury, I probably would have convicted her as well. Obviously, Megan's DNA pops up again in the trial. Do you think that that evidence was interrogated properly in the court? Was she actually interviewed? No, never. It was barely mentioned. I mean, I've read the transcript of this so many times and I'm going, what? how did that happen? But she was in the witness box. The prosecution called her, not the defence, and they laid the groundwork by saying, you know, she was homeless and she was out and about on the night of it. Couldn't remember where, couldn't remember. She couldn't remember anything actually in the witness box. She'd been quite well advised, I'd say, just say you can't remember. And you see, when you cross-examine someone, you can only ask questions on what's been led in direct evidence. So the police didn't really introduce the DNA other than to ask her whether she'd ever been on the boat, and she said no. So the defence, not having in his hand the information about the fact that, you know, she wasn't where she said she'd been on the night, and I think somewhere buried in a file that he'd been given, there was the fact that it was her DNA on the boat. I think he knew that. But he might have been under the impression that Mr Plod trotted on as well. Who knows? Anyway, he didn't do a very good job. But it was partly because the police, you see, they didn't mislead him. They just didn't give him all the information. And then she fled. There was a guy in the back of the court watching her like a hawk when she was giving evidence, probably her boyfriend. And she ran out of the court and he went with her and they were gone. And then they dived into the file that they should have dived into earlier, the defence, and they found out this, you know, conflict about the DNA and how it might have been trodden on and how it might have been found, the slipway and blah, blah. And he wanted to recall her the next day, but the judge wouldn't allow it. He said he thought it would be unfair to the poor little girl and Mr QC wanted to ask her some more nasty questions and he didn't think it was a very good idea. That was that. And then in terms of a motive, the prosecution brings up this idea that there'd been a relationship breakdown. They had a few witnesses that had said they'd seen them fighting and that she'd actually explicitly said that they were getting separated. But then Sue denies this. That's right. Well, I did mention those two blokes that she hired to sail them down. They were two people that both gave evidence to say that they thought that their relationship had broken down. There was another guy, that friend of the family in inverted commas, who they produced who had actually been charged with some offences and he, on the second day after Sue was was charged, he rang the police running the case and, and said, what benefit will you give me if I come and tell you that Sue tried to kill her brother by throwing him off the boat as well? So he then went into the police station and gave a rather negative report about Sue and said that she'd been conspiring to kill her brother and then also kill Bob. I don't know whether they gave him any reduction in his sentence, but he should have gone to jail and he didn't. So I expect they did. But you see, it's just how Sue is and it's very hard if you don't know her. Look, I had four kids under five and as they were growing up, they outnumbered me a bit. And I used to say things to them like, if you do that one more time, I'm going to tear your arm off and beat you to death with it, you know. Or <laughs> Rob, <laughs> now, did I ever do that? Of course no. not. So, you know, Sue saying, Bob, if you behave like that anymore, I'm leaving, you know. It's just Sue, you know. It's not a thing that you would say that, you know, she was planning to leave him. She wasn't. I'm sure of that. 
So the result of the trial is that Sue is found guilty of murder. She's initially sentenced to 26 years with a non-parole period of 18 years, which is slightly quashed when she appeals to a non-parole period of 13 years. Tell me about Sue's supporters. What was the reaction with that result? Well, there were a number of people like myself, really, who were horrified at the outcome. I mean, they never expected her to be found guilty. And most of them attended the trial every day. And uh, one lady in particular who's one of the sort of more senior people in the group, she was the mother of the then Premier and uh, she was formerly worked in the Justice Department and she attended every day and took copious notes and she was just flabbergasted when the jury came back and there were a group of people who, it was a growing number of people who were finding that the reports of the trial were, you know, quite unnerving, I suppose, and they started attending the court because it went on for ages. Sue was in the witness box for four days, I think, the DPP hammering her about the wrench and the, you know, never produced the wrench, of course, and, you know, never produced the uh, fire extinguisher and, you know, there's no body, so how did he know that Bob was hit on the head? So, I mean, there was a lot of disquiet about the outcome. So the Sue supporters basically grew out of a group, you know, with Sue's daughters, her former mother-in-law, her former husband and Uncle Tom Cobley and all in Hobart who thought that it was, a, you know, an unjust outcome and uh, have been holding rallies and vigils and they raised money to put big billboards up and the whole lot of stuff and it's been going on now for 13 years. The anger and the disappointment has not diminished and in fact I have to tell you this is quite recently the police officer who withheld evidence during her trial it's only just come out recently through somebody getting the documents through freedom of information that he had information that could have exonerated her and he didn't pass it on to anyone and uh, he just got the Australian police medal for his outstanding work on the Sue Neil Fraser case. It was 13 years ago. And it's because there's been so much aggro about, you know, Sue still being in jail and the Megan Bass situation that I think that the police felt, oh, dear, we better give him a little pat on the shoulder to make sure that everyone knows that we think he did a great job. And he didn't. I want to talk about some of the holes that were found in the investigation after the trial. Let's start with Paul Rowe. Who was he? He was quite a key witness, but he was never interviewed. Yes, Paul Rowe is a man of kind of dubious character, I suppose. He'd probably describe himself like that. He owned a boat and quite a reasonable size one, and he was tied up near Bob's boat. You know, he's done some bad things in his time, and he was connected to Megan Bass's boyfriend and also a homeless man who lived in his car on the foreshore. They were all sort of hung out together. It's alleged by Megan that Paul Rowe and her boyfriend, Sam Devine, were the two people who went aboard with her on that night and they went down below thinking there was nobody on board. It's fairly critical that Sue took the dinghy back to the beach leaving Bob on the boat because usually when a boat's moored and there's no dinghy attached to it, people don't think there's anyone on it. So they boarded it thinking it was empty, probably on the far side away from the shore so they couldn't be seen. Megan stayed up top. Two men went downstairs and Bob woke up. Obviously there was a scuffle and he was killed. This is according to Megan. And then she got really stressed and she was crying and carrying on and so the boyfriend was worried that she'd attract attention from the shore. She actually vomited on the boat, which is what the DNA was, and the dirty cloth I mentioned earlier that was taken in a bag that was used, we believe, to clean up the vomit and thrown into the bilge. So Megan's boyfriend took her ashore and she was cold because it was January and We believe that one of the jackets from downstairs, the red jacket, was given to her to wear ashore 
And then when she got onto the shore, she took it off and threw it over the fence and just ran off up to the street. And she was seen coming ashore that night by a hairdresser who lives in that street. So she was seen coming up from the beach rather, not ashore from a boat. I can't be that specific. And then apparently the boyfriend went back and helped Paul Rowe get rid of Bob's body. Now that's her story. She's told it time and time again. She's told it on 60 Minutes. Yep. <laughs> and uh, the police just say that it's, it's bullshit. You know, they don't believe it. They think it's made up. And yet all the bits fit together. Paul Rowe left town the next day. He sailed off. And uh, Sam Devine didn't go anywhere, but he wasn't even interviewed properly by the police. They've never really interviewed him about what happened that night because they don't believe Megan. If it's all circumstantial evidence, I don't understand how they can just dismiss Megan's story. Is it because she, you know, when you do read into Megan, she does kind of flip-flop a bit with her story and she's not the most credible of witnesses. She's a very nervy kind of person. Is that why? I'm sure it's why. And they play on that. I mean, I have to tell you, I attended, based on Megan's new evidence, has to be, you know, something fresh and, and new, the judge, thank God, gave Sue the opportunity to have another appeal. And that was, oh, it must have been about 18 months ago, I think now. The time all kind of goes together. But Robert Richter, who's a QC from Melbourne, he gave his time pro bono. He flew down and um, he said to the judges that Megan was the plank that they were going to build their appeal on and then they did have one other thing which they wanted to talk about, which was the alleged blood in the dinghy. So they were going to be the two things and he wanted to dismiss everything else because sort of, you know, taking up their honest time and they just wanted to rely on Megan's evidence. Now, that was a mistake because Megan was already stressed out to have to come and do this again, you know. She'd already done it once in front of the other judge and then the 60 minutes gig and then she's got to do it again, you know. So she... uh came with a friend who was immediately removed from the room because she wasn't an approved minder. And then the the lawyer that was supposed to be advising her in the court, he was supposed to be looking after her as well. He did bugger all. So poor old Megan sitting there basically on on her own looking at these three judges. She was in a box. She wasn't in the court. She was on video. So she's terrified. So Robert Richter stood up and just said to her, you know, were you on the boat that night? And she said, yes. And did you throw up? Yes. And tell us who the two men were who were with you. And like he probably questioned her for less than five minutes. And that was it. And he said, that's all, Your Honour, and sat down basically. Anyway, then the DPP had a go at her and he went at her for a day and a half and absolutely tore her to shreds. I mean, she was admitting to things like she told me that story about being on the boat And my book was already out there about her being on the boat. So you don't get a book out like overnight. So before that appeal, probably she must have told me that about 18 months earlier. And yet he said to her, you know, in one of his questions, you just made that story up for 60 minutes, didn't you? And she was getting so stressed that she just kept saying, yes, 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 can I go now? Yes, can I please go now? And You know, she was just answering yes to everything. It was a nightmare. It was just a nightmare sitting there watching it. I mean, the court, several times they just went like this or, you know, made really quite loud noises because it was full of Sue supporters, of course. Her Honour had to say a couple of times, you know, Mr Coates is only doing his job. And I I wrote afterwards, yes, he certainly did a job on poor Megan, you know, but I've never seen a performance like it, to be honest. I thought it was, you know, a disgrace. But anyway... He got what he wanted because she just flip-flopped and she was terrified. And in the end, Richter stood up, called for a recess, went and saw Sue and said, look, we can't rely on Megan's evidence because of the way that she's come across to the judges. We're going to have to ditch it. And was the dinghy evidence not strong enough to stand alone? No, she lost that appeal. She's going to the High Court now. But, yes, they let Megan go, poor little Megan. And, I mean, her lawyer could have asked the judges 
to suppress the names of the blokes that she gave to the court on the first day when Robert Richter asked her who was on the boat with her, and he didn't. So the next day, as Megan's coming to the court on the front page of the Mercury, there's letters like six inches big in big black letters, Sam did it, all about what Megan said about Sam. Well, that's how she felt when she got to court. She was already you know, terrified that she was going to get killed or something by these blokes. So anyway, look, it was a mess. It really was. It was a, I thought that the legal system in Tasmania should be ashamed of what the whole thing that happened. And Megan and her friend actually lodged a complaint about the lawyer that was supposed to be looking after her interests during the appeal. And of course, the legal profession board came back and said, he didn't have any standing in the court because he wasn't sitting at the bench the lawyer's bench, he was sitting in the body of the court. So he couldn't have asked the owners for anything. So, you know, they said it was a spurious complaint, which was rubbish. He could have asked Robert Richter to ask the judge to suppress it or he could have approached the bench and asked the, the judges directly. He could have easily done that, but he didn't do either of those things. Anyway, it's all history now. So it's pending to go towards to the High Court. But she would be due to be released soon, wouldn't she? Her sentence would be coming to an end. She's um, due to be parole, but she's not going to take parole because she said she's not going to admit to something she didn't do. Yeah. Okay. And usually to get parole, you have to say you're sorry and, you know, show contrition. And then they say, well, now you've been a good person, you can get out early. And they go on bail until their parole period's expired. She's told everyone that she's staying there until she's exonerated. It's not very far away. August, she's due for parole. Robin, I wanted to end with your thoughts on what this trial and this investigation tells us about the way our justice system works. Should we be concerned? Because obviously it feels like there's enough here to question that sentence, to at least be like, well, you know, there's reasonable doubt. Shouldn't we be investigating it further? But we keep getting knocked back and back and back. What do you think it says about the current state of our justice system? Look, I don't talk about the justice system because we don't actually have a justice system. We have a legal system which is supposed to deliver justice. So the legal system is made up of laws of the land and and if you follow the laws of the land then you you know you're fine. If you break the law or you go against the law or any of those bad things, then you come up for consideration for whether you should get a sentence put upon you because it's a justice being brought to bear. So In this particular case, I think generally speaking, we have probably the best legal system that we can get. I mean, I wouldn't like the European one at all. Or the American one. Or the American one. I mean, that's loaded with, you know, politics and the the European one is all on the papers and you don't call witnesses or anything like that. But there are a few things that I think should change, and one of them particularly is that I don't think experts should be called by either side. I think they should be called by the judge, and there should be a bank of experts that come and give evidence independently because if if defence calls an expert, then of course they're going to give evidence for the defence and vice versa. So, But if the court calls them, then they can give evidence impartially for the court, you know. Oh, I see what you mean. I think that could change and probably won't. And we certainly need a criminal justice review committee because, you know, the council nationally because there's been more than one unfair conviction over the years. I've been, 25 years, I've been writing books. I've written about lots of them. You know, people say, oh, well, there's not that many of them. Well, it's about between, I think it's one and three percent of the prison population is in prison for crimes they haven't committed. And you might say, well, that's not much, but it's about 2,000 people, which, you know, isn't all that many unless you're one of them. So, you know, that's another thing that we should be looking at. We should have a criminal justice review committee nationally. And then uh, as far as Sue's situation, I've written several books about this case. I've written a whole book and then I've written stories and we haven't even touched on poor Karen Keefe, who was treated so badly by the police because she became a supporter of Sue and another lawyer who's lost his job because the police don't like the way he got involved. In fact, I'm surprised I'm here sitting talking to you. I mean, maybe it's because I live in Melbourne and I've got a savage dog. 
<laughs> but, you know, I'm starting to think I might need a passport to get into Tasmania because, <laughs> you know, I have been very critical of the way that this case has been handled. And I do a lot of talks and uh, I always end them with this. Usually people stay awake, but I say even if you've fallen asleep during my talk, I want you to wake up and listen to this and take this home to your family and remember it. I don't care if you forget everything else I've said today, but remember this bit. If ever you're arrested, all you have to do is give the police your name and address, nothing else. And if they ask you any more questions, you say no comment. Do not help the police with their inquiries. That's what I want you to take home. Thanks to Robin Bowles for helping us to tell this story. You can find her books on this case, including her newest release, Collateral Damage, in our show notes. And as Robin mentioned, the parallels between the treatment of Sue Neil Fraser and Lindy Chamberlain are uncanny. If Lindy's story is one you're not familiar with, we do have a podcast called Extraordinary Stories that explores in detail what happened to her. We've linked that in our show notes for you as well, if you'd like to take a listen. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Bath, with sound design by Rhiannon Mooney. My executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you have a case you think we should cover next, get in touch with us. Send an email to truecrime at mamamia.com.au.